Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Hillary Justice, Hemingway Specialist for the JFK Library's Ernest Hemingway Collection. And on behalf of Warren Finch, Acting Director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum, and Stephen Rothstein, Executive Director of the Kennedy Library Foundation, it's my pleasure and honor to welcome you all to the 2018 Penn Hemingway Award Ceremony. Permit me a moment to acknowledge all those who make this event possible, including the many sponsors listed in your programs whose representatives and leaders are present and who join all of us in welcoming you both here and online for today's celebration of writers, writing, and as exemplified by our honorees and keynote speaker of the power of a writer's voice. A special welcome to Penn America, including CEO Suzanne Nossel, with whom we are proud to partner in our mutual efforts to locally and globally promote literature, the freedom of speech, and to the distinguished judges for all of these awards, especially Geraldine Brooks. Welcome, too, to the Ernest Hemingway Foundation, represented today by board chair Dr. Joe Flora. Penn America and the Hemingway Foundation partner with the Hemingway Family Award to all together comprise the munificence that makes this award possible. A special note of thanks to all of my colleagues here at the Kennedy Library and Kennedy Library Foundation, especially Liz Murphy and Signa Lindbergh. We're thrilled to have members of the Hemingway family joining us here in Boston and watching online. Our greetings go out over the live stream to Ernest Hemingway's son Patrick and his wife Carol, who are watching from their home in Montana. Patrick and Carol are the vanguard of support for the Penn Hemingway Awards and for the JFK Library's Ernest Hemingway Collection, the world's repository for the writer's personal papers, photographs, and mementos. Patrick's annual readings from his father's works at the Penn Hemingway Ceremony have for decades marked the return of spring for us at the library. And as he steps down from that role this year, as he celebrates his 90th birthday, we send our heartfelt and heart full gratitude. Stepping into his uncle's, <laughs> thank you. Stepping into his uncle's role this year is the writer's grandson, Dr. Sean Hemingway, who along with his wife, Dr. Colette Hemingway, co-chairs the Hemingway Council, which raises funds for and awareness of the collection. And as always, we are especially delighted to welcome Sean and Colette's daughter, Anouk Hemingway, the writer's great-granddaughter. To open today's collection in celebration of writers, writing, and fiction, I'd like to tell you a true story. The story of a time when Ernest Hemingway couldn't write and of what happened next. Once upon a time, that time being December of 1922, Ernest Hemingway's first wife, Hadley Richardson, chose as a surprise to pack all of his existing stories, the draft of a novel, carbon copies, everything into a suitcase. A lot of you know where the story is going already. She was going to meet him for an impromptu skiing trip to get out of the misery that was gray Paris. So she took all of their stuff to the Gare de Lyon, the train station, um, and as legend has it, she went off to get a drink of water or something equally innocuous, and when she came back, that one case had been stolen. At that point in the story, my students would always say, oh, somebody got all of Ernest Hemingway's papers, it was because he was famous. No. <laughs> the French thief got a bunch of scribbles in English by a writer who hadn't published anything yet. They're long malingering in a Paris dumpster, and I think everyone has entertained fantasies of finding them, but that's just, I'm afraid that's not gonna happen. So Hemingway couldn't believe that she had packed everything. So he caught the first train back to Paris, went through their apartment, and there were a couple of stories that had survived. One of them, Gertrude Stein, had told him he couldn't publish it. Another was off for publication. But for the most part, it was everything he had written to date. And so, like you do, when facing the blue screen when your computer dies the night before a deadline, he got a great case of writer's block. So in a movable feast, he tells this story. And to overcome this writer's block, the 23-year-old Ernest Hemingway told himself, all you have to do is write one true sentence. Write the truest sentence you know. That sentence was this. I have seen the one-legged streetwalker who works the Boulevard Madeleine from the Rue Cambon to Bernheim Jeunes 
limping along the pavement through the crowd on a rainy night with a beefy, red-faced Episcopal clergyman holding an umbrella over her. I love that sentence. <laughs> My English majors and I used to spend up to an hour unpacking that one sentence. What kind of truth begins, I have seen? Ernest Hemingway's truth. Hemingway wrote um, a few more sentences after that one, rather a lot of them, and their truths evolved over his life and also over the lives and changing cultural moments of his readers. Just out of curiosity yesterday, I asked my Facebook friends, what's your favorite Hemingway sentence? And as their favorite Hemingway sentences started to come in, I started to see some beautiful patterns emerge. Some of them were grouped thematically. Um, they ranged over the writer's entire life. And so I wanted to share some of those sentences with you today. The ones you would expect came first. The world breaks everyone, and afterward many are strong at the broken places. And the much later, a man can be destroyed, but not defeated. In the same vein, the less well-known, when it's once right, you can never do it again. From the philosophical to the practical, beer's a food. <laughs> From those moments when a relationship might not be going so well, you get, from the very early 1920s, it isn't fun anymore. In 1926, isn't it pretty to think so? 1927, I'm fine. And the perennial favorite, would you please, 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 please stop talking? And the only possible response, Nick said nothing. On animals, a very young child's, I know where there's black squirrels, Daddy, which becomes a drunken road to hell paved with unbought stuffed dogs, becomes later in his life the more thoughtful. No one has explained what the leopard was seeking at that altitude. On landscapes, northern Michigan, the river was there. Urban Spain, the light is very good, and also now there are shadows of the leaves. Tanzania. The sky is very high there, and branches come between, from under which, beyond a tent, you step out to see too many stars. Finally, on death, which Hemingway ultimately reminds us is also on life. From childhood, in the early morning on the lake, sitting in the stern of the boat with his father rowing, he felt quite sure that he would never die. To war. The world is a fine place and worth the fighting for, and I hate very much to leave it. To the last line of the last work he published during his lifetime, the old man was dreaming about the lions. So back to that emerging writer in Paris. Hemingway went on to write six of those one true sentences, then to write the flash fiction short paragraph stories that would eventually comprise the interchapters of In Our Time. These contain the single Hemingway sentence that appears on the GRE English subject test. Question, Ernest Hemingway wrote which of the following quotations? If you answered A, everybody was drunk, give yourself 10 points. With the flash fiction finished, Hemingway next progressed to writing very short stories, including a very short story, then on to slightly longer stories, culminating in a short story that was very long indeed, The Big Two-Hearted River, parts one and two. Its drafts are even longer still. It's comprised of over 100 pages in manuscript. While writing, though, Ernest Hemingway cut an extended personal rant out of the middle, keeping his focus sharp on Nick Adams fishing alone in Michigan, seeking to integrate the double trauma of loss in war and loss in love. Then, as if the big two-hearted river overflowed its banks, Hemingway finally wrote his first major novel, The Sun Also Rises, also a story of attempting to overcome and integrate the trauma of loss in war and loss in love. Lucky for us, here in the archives, Hemingway was just a little bit of a pack rat, and he kept those. And in our research rooms, you can read that cut section of Big Two-Hearted River, 
which among other things tells the story of Hemingway himself crossing a lake in an open boat in the rain holding an umbrella. Readers of A Farewell to Arms will recognize that instantly as a scene from that novel, which Hemingway wrote a few years later. A scene in which Frederick and Catherine choose love over war, heading across Lago Maggiore in an open boat on a rainy night, holding an umbrella, to neutral Switzerland where they await the birth of their child. Spoiler alert. That story ends on another rainy night with a bereft, one-hearted Frederick limping along another road, alone, in a crowd, but this time it's just a crowd of raindrops. He shares so much with the 1922 Parisian prostitute who walked a street named after Mary Magdalene. But by 1929, the mature Hemingway's truth required no props. Frederick has neither umbrella nor nearby clergyman. Until you find all you'll find of compassion, in the double-edged baptismal blessing of the falling rain. How truth evolves in the sentences of a future winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sean Hemingway. Dr. Hemingway is John A. and Carol O. Moran acting curator in charge at New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. He is a seasoned archaeologist with a particular specialty in Greek and Roman bronzes and has excavated prehistoric, classical, and Roman sites in Greece and Spain. He received his doctorate from Bryn Mawr College, studied as a Fulbright scholar at the American School of Classical Studies in Athens, and has been a visiting curator at the American Academy in Rome. He is author of numerous scholarly publications, including The Horse and Jockey from Artemisian, a bronze equestrian monument of the Hellenistic period, and of the novel, The Tomb of Alexander. He is also, because he's not busy enough, the editor of the Hemingway Library editions of Ernest Hemingway's works. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sean Hemingway. Thank you, Hillary. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you this afternoon and to fill in for my Uncle Patrick, who who did this 30 years pretty much straight. And uh, Patrick uh, asked me to read uh, to you uh, um, his foreword to the recent edition, Hemingway Library edition that we did of Green, he and I did of Green Hills of Africa in 2015. So I'd like to read that to you now and then I'm gonna follow it up with a short passage from Green Hills. Green Hills of Africa, like Gaul, is divided into parts Specifically, four pursuits, of which the last is pursuit as happiness. The American reader will recognize this rearrangement of Jefferson's elegant phrase. Pursuit is happiness. Isn't it pretty to think so that ends the sun also rises? And a one and only life were the three things my father, Patrick's father, my grandfather, <laughs> felt he had to believe. For the rest, he had only to, to so understand reality as to make up stories readers would feel were real, using short sentences, or if necessary, ones as long as ever penned by Henry James. In a trip my parents took me with them to New York in 1935, riding down Fifth Avenue in an open top bus with my father when I was still just learning to read. We got, to the, we got off at the Scribner bookstore for Papa to look at a handsome display of green and black books that now I know was Green Hills of Africa. Papa was happy. As I remember, we didn't go into the building, just looked in the window. Some of you may remember that elegant store. Another day in that trip to New York, Papa took me to see the African Hall at the American Museum of Natural History. The African Hall was not yet open to the public, and Papa talked with Louis Jonas about his finishing the elephant group started by Carl Akeley and interrupted by his untimely death from fever in the Congo while collecting gorilla specimens 
for the hall in what is now Virunga National Park. Our third excursion was by train north of the city to the Jonas Brothers taxidermy firm to check on the trophy mounts they were doing for my father from that safari in 1933 and 34. Later, the arrival in Key West of Papa's trophy mounts of buffalo, lion, greater kudu, and other antelope, tastefully distributed by my mother throughout every room in the house. In the bedroom I shared with my younger brother Gregory, my dad, it was a wildebeest. <laughs> this made East Africa my promised land. But then, who of us hasn't had a promised land? caught up with happiness, the constant nymph, and run with her swiftly through the green birch forest of Arden, only to trip and fall and watch her disappear into the trees without a backward glance. So light a candle, love the light, and face the darkness when the candle fails. Patrick Hemingway. So I'd like to read you a very short passage from Green Hills that's one of my favorite passages from the last section, the pursuit as happiness section. So sure enough, we put up partridges and watching them fly, I was thinking all the country in the world is the same country and all hunters are the same people. Then we saw a fresh kudu track beside the trail and then as we move through the early morning woods, no undergrowth now, the first sun coming through the tops of the trees, we came on the ever miracle of elephant tracks. Each one as big around as the circle you make with your arms, putting your hands together, and sunk a foot deep in the loam of the forest floor, where some bull had passed, traveling after rain. Looking at the way the tracks graded down through the pleasant forest, I thought that we had the mammoths too, a long time ago. And when they traveled through the hills in southern Illinois, they made these same tracks. It was just that we were an older country in America and the biggest game was gone. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Geraldine Brooks, and it was my great privilege, along with Elizabeth Strout and Christopher Castellini, to be the judges of this year's Penn Hemingway Award for First Novel. What an amazing predictor of future success this award is. Uh, if I say just a few names, Marilyn Robinson, Teju Cole, Ben Fountain, um, Jhumpa Lahiri, I could go on and on. Um, for us as judges, it was an immense privilege to dive into the latest novels, the very newest expressions of this wonderful adventure of American letters. And in the end, what we heard was a symphony, a magnificent diversity of energetic voices coming from all sectors of this country, all kinds of backgrounds, telling us about experiences that we will never have, that we hope to never have. One of our um, honorees today is incarcerated. Several of them have shared the immigrant experience. It was a treasure trove and I was uh, with my fellow judges thrilled to have this immersion. So, um, I have to announce the uh, honorable mentions first, and uh, one of our honorees is here today, Ian Bassingthwaite, whose wonderful book, Live from Cairo, explores the experience of being a refugee in this current tumultuous time. 
in. Uh, our second honorable mention, unfortunately, is unable to be with us today because he is incarcerated, but he has brought us a voice that we seldom hear, a voice that is too often unheard in his remarkable collection of short stories, The Gray Bar Hotel. Uh, now to our finalists. Um, our first finalist, Lisa Ko, uh, has written uh, The Leavers, and her novel, uh, I'm going to read the citation. Lisa Ko's The Leavers is at once as urgent as a news headline and a timeless exploration of longing, loss, and the struggle to belong. Fifth grader, Deming, and his undocument, undocumented immigrant mother are barely making it in New York when she suddenly disappears, ripped away in an ice raid and deported to China with no way to get word to her son. Through these two shattered lives, Ko probes the private pain of abandonment and the public cost of an inhuman policy. And to read from the leavers, uh, Naji Nieto, uh, from Pen America. Lisa was uh, very sorry that she couldn't make it here today, and I feel very honored to be able to read her words. So I'm just going to read the first few pages of her novel, The Leavers. It's the one. The day before Deming Guo saw his mother for the last time, she surprised him at school. A navy blue hat sat low on her forehead, scarf around her neck like a big brown snake. What are you waiting for, kid? It's cold out. He stood in the doorway of PS 33 as she zipped his coat so hard the collar pinched. Did you get off work early? It was 4.30, already dark, but she didn't usually leave the nail salon until six. They spoke, as always, in Fujinese. Short shift. Michael said you had to stay late to get help on an assignment. Her eyes narrowed behind her glasses, as if she couldn't tell, and he couldn't tell if she bought it or not. Teachers didn't call your mom when you got detention, only gave a form you had to return with a signature, which he forged. Michael, who never got detention, had left after eighth period, and Deming wanted to get back home with him in front of the television, where, in the safety of a laugh track, he didn't have to worry about letting anyone down. Snow fell like clots of wet laundry. Deming and his mother walked up Jerome Avenue. In the back of a concrete courtyard, three older boys were passing a blunt, coats unzipped, wearing neither backpacks nor hats, sweet smoke and laughter warming the thin February air. I don't want you to be like that, she said. I don't want you to be like me. I didn't even finish eighth grade. What a sweet idea, not finishing eighth grade. He could barely finish fifth. His teachers said it was an issue of focus, of not applying himself. Yet when he tripped Travis Bopa in math class, Deming had been as shocked as Travis was. I'll come to your school tomorrow, his mother said. Talk to your teacher about that assignment. He kept his arm against his mother's, loved the scratchy sound of their jackets rubbing together. She wasn't one of those TV moms, always hugging their kids or watching them with bemused smiles, but insisted on holding his hand when they crossed a busy street. Inside her gloves, her hands were red and scraped, the skin angry and peeling, and every night before she went to sleep, she rubbed a thick lotion onto her fingers and winced. Once he asked if it made them hurt less. She said only for a little while, 
and he wished there was a special lotion that could make her new skin grow a pair of super power gloves. Short and blocky, she wore loose jeans. Never had he seen her in a dress. And her voice was so loud that when she called his name, dogs would bark and other kids jerked around. When she saw his last report card, he thought her shouting would set off the car alarms four stories below. But her laughter was as loud as her shouting. And there was no better, more gratifying sound than when she slapped her knees and cackled at something silly. She laughed at things that weren't meant to be funny, like TV dramas and the swollen orchestral soundtracks that accompanied them. Or better yet, at things Deming said, like when he nailed the way their neighbor Tommy always went, not bad, not bad, not bad, when they passed him in their stairwell, an automatic response to a hello, how are you, that hadn't even yet been issued. Or the time she'd asked, flipping through TV stations, Dancing with the Stars isn't on, and he'd excavated Michael's old paper mobile of the solar system and waltzed with it through the living room as she clapped. It was almost as good as getting cheered on by his friends. When he had lived in Myanjang with his grandfather, Deming's mother had explored New York by, his, by herself. There was a restlessness to her, an inability to be still or settled. She jiggled her legs, bounced her knees, cracked her knuckles, twirled her thumbs. She hated being cooped up in the apartment on a sunny day, paced the rooms from wall to wall to wall, a cigarette dangling from her mouth. Who wants to go for a walk, she would say. Her boyfriend, Leon, would tell her to relax, sit down. Sit down, we've been sitting all day. Deming would want to stay on the couch with Michael, but he couldn't say no to her, and they'd go out. No family, but each other. He would have her to himself, an ambling walk in the park or along the river, making up stories about who lived in the apartments they saw from the outside. A family named Smith, five kids, father dead, mother addicted to bagels. <laughs> he speculated the day before they went, the day they went to the Upper East Side. To bagels, she said, what flavor bagel? Everything bagels, he said which made her giggle for harder until they were both bent over on Madison Avenue, laughing so hard no sounds were coming out, and his stomach hurt, but he couldn't stop laughing, old white people giving them the stink eye for stopping in the middle of the sidewalk. Deming and his mother loved everything bagels, the sheer balls of it, the audacity, the New York audacity that a bagel could, uh, that a bagel could proclaim to be everything, even if it was only topped with sesame seeds and poppy seeds and salt. A bus lumbered past, spraying salt, slush. The walk sign flashed on. You know what I did today, his mother said. One lady, she had a callus the size of your nose on her heel. I had to scrape off all that dead skin. It took forever, and her tip was shit. You'll never do that if you're careful. He dreaded this familiar refrain. His mother could curse, but the time he, the one time he'd let out, motherfucker, let it bounce out in front of him, in front of her, loving the way the syllables got meatball-y in his mouth. She had slapped his arm and said he was better than that. Now he silently said the word to himself as he walked, one syllable per footstep. Did you think that when I was growing up, a small girl your age, I thought, hey, one day I'm going to go all the way to New York so I can pick Gao Gao out of a stranger's toe? That was not my plan. Always be prepared, she'd like to say. Never rely on anyone else to give you things you can get for yourself. She despised laziness, softness, people who were weak. She had few friends, but was true to the ones she had. She could hold a fierce grudge, would walk an extra three blocks to another grocery store because two years ago, the cashier at the one around the corner had smirked at her lousy English. It was lousy, Deming agreed. Thank you. Uh, I'm extremely happy that Adelia Saunders is here with us to celebrate her remarkable novel, Indelible, 
and I will read the citation. A page-turning mystery with a literary sensibility, an elegant interweaving of European history with a contemporary quest for truth, an old-fashioned love story with an otherworldly twist. Adelia Saunders's indelible is fantastic in every sense of the word. In sculpted prose that juggles, juggles multiple points of view and time zones, the novel builds to crescendos both heartbreaking and hopeful, all the while contending with a compelling question. How would you live if you knew the fates of the ones you loved? Adelia. Adelia is going to read for us. Hello. Um, well, thank you so much to, um, to Penn and the Hemingway Foundation, the judges, and my fellow honorees. Um, I'm so honored to be here with you all. Thank you. Um, I have my little helper up here. She may help me make this uh, especially brief if she starts to cry. Um, but I'm going to read just a short passage from my book. Uh, this is from the perspective of Richard. Uh, who's, an, who's an American man in his 50s. Um, his mother was a famous writer who abandoned him at birth um, and left him to be raised by his aunt and his uncle on their struggling cattle farm in Colorado. So uh, Richard grows up there with his cousins, Pearl and Eddie, and his aunt, Kat, and his uncle, Walt. I don't think Walt ever gave much thought to the fact that his wife's sister was a writer. My uncle Walt was a star man the way some people are horsemen or Harley Davidson men. I doubt he ever read two books of fiction in his life. Each year for Christmas, my Aunt Cat got him a subscription to Sky and Telescope, with the first issue bought off the news rack in town and wrapped up in paper. He bought himself a little telescope, and sometimes when you thought he was out checking on the cows in the evenings, he was really up on the water tower with it. The water tower was only 10 or 12 feet high, but my Uncle Walt took what he could get. And when Aunt Cat said he'd better come down before he broke his neck, he said you never knew what there might be a star 10 or 12 feet farther off out there in infinity, and he wasn't going to miss it for lack of standing on the water tower. Uncle Walt never said much about what he saw out there, but sometimes when I went out with him to do the irrigation, he'd give me a little lesson in astronomy. I can picture us rolling on boots, turned to spheres by the mud, Uncle Walt with a shovel over his shoulder, me dragging mine along behind me, making a slick mud trail through the grass while the dogs chased the prairie dogs that had been flooded out of their holes. Out in the field at dusk, when maybe Jupiter was lighting up just past the hills, or Mars was glowing behind a constellation of mosquitoes, Uncle Walt would get to talking about black holes and extinct stars, specks of light out there that took a billion years to make it to our eyes and stopped existing in the meantime. Uncle Walt would set his boot on the shovel and dig up a thick notch of mud and grass to block the irrigation channel and direct the water down along to the other field, telling me that every inch of sky was thick with galaxies hurtling away from each other into a void whose emptiness you had to bend your mind to get your head around. And I would listen to him with the eagerness particular to nephews kept on charity, doing my best to bend my brain, when the truth was, all I could imagine of the vastness of the universe was a panel of light bulbs stuck onto a grid in front of the sky. I've wondered recently why it was always only him and me who went out to do the irrigation. Pearl would have been helping Aunt Cat fix supper, but where was Eddie all those evenings? He might have been there too, for all I know, off a little way blocking one end with, of a prairie dog hole with his shovel while the dogs howled and dug around the other end while I listened to Uncle Walt's musings on a supernova out there past Polaris that was bigger and hotter than a million suns, and would one of these eons collapse in on itself and become a black hole the size of a pinprick with an appetite for all its neighbors. I would have been listening without understanding much. So, like a puppy so eager to sit and stay, it scooches forward on its haunches with the effort, while my Uncle Walt, who sold his cattle by the pound, his hay by the ton, who bought his gasoline by the gallon and endured those Sunday sermons by the minute, for whom volume, mass, and time were such earthly facts, alterable only by more rain, more fertilizer, or in the case of church by calving season, marveled at the suppleness of the universe. But it's possible that Eddie wasn't there, that Uncle Walt took me alone out to do the irrigating. 
Eddie was going to get the farm, that is, if he had wanted it. Pearl would get the house, and they took turns getting the egg with the double yolk at breakfast. But I used to like to imagine that Uncle Walt wanted to give me something, too, a head full of facts or a feeling of having been singled out for a bit of conversation. Thank you. And now for our winner, Waiki Wang. Her brilliant novel, Chemistry, is, according to the citation, a brilliant book where the style of writing matches the story itself. The novel presents the profound sense of dislocation and uncertainty that occurs when a young Chinese-American woman has to face her future and cannot understand which steps to take. The sense of disappointing her parents is packed into this book, almost without being said. Written in elliptical prose, spare and clean as a bone, the reader is ushered into a world they will not quickly forget. And to read to us, Waiki Wang. Hi there. Um, it's a pleasure to read from this book, and it's an honor to be here with everyone, um, and thank you for coming. Uh, I've, I've read from the beginning of this book quite a few times, and I, I wanted to start at a different place, just for my own benefit and your benefit. Um, the context is that the story starts in which the narrator, who is unnamed, and her boyfriend, Eric, um, are deciding whether or not they want to get married, and Eric has asked her that question from the beginning. Um, I'm reading closer to the middle of the novel. Um, something has happened to their apartment, and they're in an inn, but she's still undecided about this question. The optimist sees the glass half full. The pessimist sees the glass half empty. The chemist sees the glass completely full, half in liquid state and half in gaseous, both of which are probably poisonous. At the start of grad school, the safety officer warns us that working in a chem lab can shave five years off your life. Some things will never leave your lungs, he says, silica, for instance. Oh well, who needs to live that long anyway? Because the inn has no kitchen, we have been eating a lot of granola bars. I don't understand when I read on food packages that something is chemical free. I immediately take offense. Everything is made up of chemicals. To say that something is chemical free is to say that inside this package is an absolute vacuum. Why would I pay this much for a vacuum? Also, how much, is, how much granola is too much? The only difference between a poison and a cure is dosage. Drink too much water and you will die. Inhale water and you will die as well. Chemists long ago used to stir their reactions by hand. I am being quite literal. They used to check for the doneness with one finger in the pot. The mark of a good chemist used to be the number of fingers you had. The fewer, the better. It showed more experience in the lab. Eric has 10 fingers and all 10 toes. I joke he must not be a very good chemist, and he gives me a genuine smile. But then the job offers come in, including Oberlin, Ohio. He puts a doily on my head and dances me around the room. The moment we're back in our old apartment, he asks the first question again. Say yes, I want to. He asks the second question, come with me, I want to. Then say yes, isn't it enough that I want to? Eric has never jogged until now. I think it is to minimize his time at home with me. Outside it is warm and joggers are rampant along the river. But Eric is the only one doing it in jeans and waterproof boots. Would you rather spend eternity exploring the oceans or space? A question I ask after he has a bad day in lab. He comes home exhausted, he slumps into his chair, he sighs when I ask him anything. So I come up with silly questions to get him to talk. He says space because it is far away from planet Earth. 
I say ocean because at least it is planet Earth. And think of all the sea animals we could track down Nessie or Moby Dick and then get rich. Also, I remind him being in space is probably a lot like being in lab. For miles and miles, there is no one. The atmosphere is completely sterile. And then I add, if you went into space, I would too. Space, the last frontier, the final frontier, I say in my best Spock voice. I have been expecting this moment, haven't I? And yet, why is the wind still knocked out of me? He has said just now, some time apart wouldn't be the worst. Perhaps I had never thought he would say it so casually, so word for word, and in the produce department of a grocery store. Was that a question, I ask him? But he refuses to look me in the eye. He turns, he throws a dozen apples into a bag. Deer arrows are engineered to go cleanly through, but to penetrate a few inches and lodge. Initially, the deer does not feel excessive pain. Then the razor sharp edges slice through the surrounding tissue as the deer runs. This causes hemorrhaging and the deer eventually bleeds out. I did, I did say that I would follow him to space and that still stands, but I did not say Ohio. <laughs> Fear of following the other person despite the person being good and reasonable and kind, what phobia is that? Stupidity. Before he leaves the city, he wants to go to a jazz club. Which one? Riles, but that's just two blocks away. He says he likes it anyway. We walk towards a glowing neon sign. He is in a gray blazer that is slim fit and I am in a black dress that is too tight. All the eating, drinking. But I tell myself weight is just an artifact of gravity. If this were a jazz club on the moon, I would be weightless. On this date, there is no kissing or hand holding or mentioning that this is a date. He calls it an expedition to tease me. He wonders why we haven't come to Riles before probably because it's just two blocks away. I, knew, I know nothing about jazz except Louis Armstrong. That is a start, he says. Now what instrument did he play? I guess trumpet and I'm rewarded with a smile. We sit on velvet, plush velvet chairs. I see a brass, a trumpet, a drum set, a group dressed in all black swaying in the center of the room. I sit up straight, my back a plank of wood. If I don't focus, I will instead fall asleep, like I have many times at the symphony, and woken up to find that I have missed everything, the applause for the encore, the encore. Right now, it is what a wonderful life, and next it would be Caravan. But soon the band plays something that has no name and goes on for a long time. The crowd is drawn up to their feet, and so is Eric. But what are they playing? What is this song? I applaud, but think sooner or later someone is going to fumble. Miles Davis, do not fear the mistakes. There are, no, there are none. I'm strong. Man, if you've got to ask, you'll never know. Later that evening, Eric shares a neat fact with me. He has had a few drinks. He brings his face closer to mine. The neat fact, drummers will bury new symbols to speed up the aging process that gives the metal an earthy sound, a ta instead of a ping. I giggle when he says the word earthy. Your puns, I say. What puns, he says. The breaking of bonds requires energy. This is the fundamental law of thermodynamics. We walk along the river, arms crossed, me, hands in pocket, him. The river is very polluted, I say. Take care of yourself, he says. College students jump in here all the time. It's three meals a day and the occasional glass of wine. One in 10 succeed, the other nine swim to shore terrified. Did you hear what I said? Yes, three meals a day taken with wine. Packing commences. If he is to start in the fall, he must leave in early summer to set up his lab. The dog is frantic but strategic. He sits on shoes so Eric won't pack them. He sits on clothes so Eric won't fold them. He sits inside luggage bags so Eric won't close them. I try to lure him away with treats, big juicy marrow bones, beef jerky, two scoops of vanilla ice cream, but he doesn't come. Packing takes days. We clean up the spot where he pees. He pees all over Eric's ties. We take these ties to the dry cleaners and wait for them to call us. We clean up the spot where he poos. He poos all over Eric's fresh suit. We take the suit to the dry cleaner and wait for them to call us. What's wrong with your dog, they ask. <laughs> Willful incontinence? <laughs> we finish packing when the dog has run out of ideas, but not quite. At the gate, he goes through his repertoire of twix, tricks, 
sit, lie down, crawl, play dead, roll over, high five, sit, lie down, crawl, play dead, roll over, high five. I ask him to please be dignified about this, but I've not taught him that command. Dog, Eric says, and bends down to scratch his ears. Man, dog says, and lets out a long howl, furry browed Rosalem. A frustrated dog will shed, and now I must follow him around with a lint roller. It's doable, I say to the shrink, to drive to Oberlin in one furious night. But that is not love, she says. That is fear of facing your own demons. I don't have demons, I say. I have students and a dog. But at night, I do close all my closets out of fear of what might be inside. Dark matter, I believe. I tell the best friend he left, and I let him. He, she, he said he would try not to call. What are you going to do, she asks. Not dwell, move forward. What are you really going to do? Stare at spoons. I tell the best friend, me and the dog make two, and two points to find a line. But remember what Dr. Who said about lines, not at all interesting. You need three or more points to define a shape. The triangle is the strongest of all shapes. When you think geometry, think triangles, the theorem that everyone knows by name, Pythagoras, is a theorem about a triangle. If I could go back in time, I would design apartments that could not echo. I would evoke sound's ability to echo in the first place. It is the echo and the dark matter that keep me up at night. If I go back in time, I would sleep and sleep. But Hawking made a very simple case for why time travel is not possible. No one in the past has come forward and no one in the future has come back. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Suzanne Noss, I'm the CEO of PEN America. First off, my hearty congratulations to Waiki Wang for her extraordinary achievement and to all the honorees. I'm delighted and honored to be here to celebrate the 43rd annual PEN Hemingway Awards Ceremony. This is the first ceremony, at least in recent memory, in which PEN America has participated directly. The success and power of this award is tribute to the passion and vision of the Hemingway family, the foundation, the JFK Library, and the dedicated group of volunteers and leaders who, for many years, made up Penn New England. As an organization of writers, the essence of Penn is individual initiative. True to the New England spirit, the literary community here organized itself decades ago to create a vibrant collective of writers, editors, readers, and lovers of literature who came together to build community, honor great writing, and forge literary fellowship. Now, in 2018, Penn's presence in, Boston, in the Boston era enters a new chapter, one that coincides with new directions for Penn America across the country. First, I want to uh, since I'm new to many of you, and we are new to many of you, I want to give a quick introduction to our organization. PEN America's mission is to both celebrate and defend freedom of expression worldwide. We're the largest node within an international network of PEN centers in over 100 countries. We celebrate through the nation's most comprehensive program of literary awards, encompassing fiction, nonfiction, biography, playwriting, science, and more. We hold more than 50 intimate literary dinners each year that take place in private homes and center around an individual author and a new book. We host the annual Penn World Voices Festival of International Literature, which starts a week from tomorrow. It's our 14th festival, and it'll bring more than 100 writers from all over the world together with American literary luminaries for a week of panels, readings, interviews, discussions, and provocations. This year's theme is Resist and Reimagine. The festival was founded by Salman Rushdie in the years after 9-11 out of concern that the channels of communication between the United States and the rest of the world were narrowing. In a moment of neo-isolationism, the mission of the festival assumes new urgency. This year's lineup includes Colson Whitehead, David Eggers, Roxane Gay, Masha Gessen, Laurie Anderson, Nicole Krauss, Jhumpa Lahiri, Ron Chernow, and dozens, dozens of others. Our closing Arthur Miller Freedom to Write lecture will be delivered by Hillary Clinton, followed by a conversation with the novelist Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. And every year there are Penn members in Boston who come down for the festival, and I hope you'll consider joining them. But at, at Penn America, 
Our celebrations, large and small, are not just for their own sake. They are all in service of our, mission, our obligation to defend free expression worldwide. What draws people to Penn may be the programs, the awards, or the bold-faced names, but what keeps them with us is a sense of collective conscience. We honor great writing as a way to remind ourselves what is at stake when the freedom to create is denied. Traditionally, much of the focus of our work has been on the global front lines of free expression battles. When a writer anywhere is arrested, prosecuted, jailed, or threatened, we spring into action. Writers like Walon and Kaso U in Myanmar, who right now face a 14-year prison sentence for having the courage to investigate and expose a brutal massacre of Muslim Rohingya men in the village of Indin. But we also do work to prevent, aim to prevent those encroachments on free speech from happening in the first place. We've worked closely with two formerly jailed writers to help establish and strengthen Myanmar Pen as a force for free expression in that country. We're now doing the same with Pen colleagues in Ukraine and Belarus. We've for years documented the deteriorating environment for free expression in China, working shoulder to shoulder with colleagues at the independent Chinese Pen Center, including its founder and former, pre Nobel and, and former president, Nobel Peace Prize winner, Liu Xiaobo. When Liu Xiaobo was jailed, Pen America launched the campaign for his freedom. When we learned last summer that he was suffering from liver cancer, we worked to get Western doctors in to see him. When he passed away, we mobilized a protest at the Chinese mission to mourn and object to his untimely and probably avoidable death. We're now pressing for the freedom of his wife, the poet Liu Jia. While we've always done work on the United States, over the last 18 months, the America in Pen America has taken on new meaning. Threats to the press, disingenuous cries of fake news, bald-faced lies, the emboldening of hate speech, interference with research and science, and the erection of new barriers to public discourse pose profound threats to open expression. So Pen America has gone into overdrive. We elevate the voices of Muslim Americans, dreamers, incarcerated writers, and ordinary laborers. We've convened closed-door, in-depth convenings at the site of the most pitched campus free speech controversies, including UC Berkeley, Middlebury, and the University of Virginia at Charlottesville. We put out a daily digest on rights and expression to keep our community informed and awake to threats to our freedoms. We issued a groundbreaking report on fraudulent news, becoming the first organization to name it as a free expression issue. We opened a Washington office to bring our members' concerns straight to Capitol Hill. We've also mobilized our membership across the country, putting on events and campaigns in more than 16 cities, including Tucson, Tulsa, Birmingham, Nashville, Detroit, and Indianapolis. We've also, over the last few months, merged with the Sister Penn Center in Los Angeles, giving us tent poles on either coast to stand up a national organization. As the going has gotten tough here, Penn has gotten going, expanding our membership, our research, our programs, and our advocacy to meet what we view as a moment of crisis for expression in our own country. While we're focused on crisis, we're also striving to look ahead to a time beyond crisis, preparing for a moment where maybe our society can be strong at the broken places. All that brings me back to Boston. At a time when we were mobilizing to forge a stronger, more united, more national organization, our group of volunteers here at Penn New England approached us to say they too were ready for a change. Their tools of communication and fundraising had begun to run their course. They were ready to plug into a larger organization. We applaud their efforts and dedication and are eager to ensure that everything they've built on here will thrive. We're now in a phase of transition and transformation looking to build a new future for Penn here in Boston. We aim to carry out programs locally that will showcase the extraordinary writers, their stories and ideas, just as we're doing here today with the Kennedy Library and the Hemingway Family and Foundation. We aim to build an activist base that can be a strong voice within a powerful national organization. We aim to mount campaigns that are locally salient and nationally and internationally resonant. We're building partnerships with the Kennedy Library, local museums, book fairs, and other allies. If you're not yet a Penn member, I urge you to visit Penn.org and join us. Please make a note that you're here today and are part of our valued Boston constituency. 
Our hashtag over the last 18 months has been louder together. This moment demands that our diverse voices be raised in unison to defend the ideals that underpin Penn's purpose, to uphold free expression for all. Thank you for being here with us this afternoon to celebrate that and for standing with us in our mission to defend it. And with that, I want to thank Hillary Justice and the JFK Library for identifying and inviting our keynote speaker this afternoon, Ricardo Cortez Cruz. He's the author of the novel Straight Out of Compton and Five Days of Bleeding and is professor of English and Creative Writing at Illinois State University. He's finishing a third body of uh, language titled Premature Autopsies, Tales of Darkest America, Ricardo Cortez Cruz. Sorry, I had to go for the water. Um, <laughs> I, and thank you so much, Suzanne. And I also want to thank Hillary as well. Um, you know, Hillary's wonderfulness, along with that of Ernest Hemingway and so many others, um, are always with me and are a source of strength for me. So I want to be sure to acknowledge that as well. Um, I'll try not to be long, I promise. My knees are already shaking more than Don Knotts' character in the movie The Ghost and Mr. Chicken. <laughs> Anxiety crawling out of the portholes of my skin coupled with the speech impediment where as a child I struggled to say or roll the R in my own name are reasons I started to write in the first place. In the beginning, there was the word. There was, there's the African concept of nomo, N-O-M-M-O where the word is believed to be the force of life itself. Them words, everything, Precious says in Sapphire's debut novel titled Push. I grew up putting my faith in the magical powers of the word. My frictions became spoken soul, rhythm and blues spat out as if shrapnel. Fragments revealed how hurt I was. Realizing to speak is to make something come into being, I promised myself back in the day I would find a way to represent and represent the reality of double consciousness. As black scholar W.E.B. Du Bois noted, double consciousness wrestles with two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideas in one body. Seemingly, it is the type of conflict writers bring into existence anyway. At home, I wrote furiously. I began talking out the side of my neck like it was nothing, writing obsessively about black widows and daddies with long legs, entangling myself in webs of meaning. I was hungry. As a kid, I totally let poverty get the best of me. Ketchup sandwiches constantly reminded my butt I was falling behind. I once snuck into the basement of an abandoned house hoping to discover what it meant to enjoy the luxury of something. As soon as I climbed back out of the house's window to return to my own life, two police officers were waiting. I wasn't trying to steal, but I couldn't articulate what I had in mind. I've probably never gotten over the embarrassment. It changed my composition. I needed to be a writer, not a cliche. After all, writers are bad. And in my language, the correct spelling of that word is B-A-D-D. The Urban Dictionary uses bad for the very fashionable and or the stylish. We possess the ability and confidence to go down the road not taken. We can plant a seed into the senses of the mind, then water, nurture what must bloom. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. We can generate and create reality. That feels like freedom, something so sweet and, um, in my case, turns into the form of Black's magic when it's all finished. From day one, I've wanted to perform life writing, where the writing is about restoring and restoring the self and others, is about righting wrongs. That's a lot, that's a lot of heavy lifting for anybody I know. So much unsaid stuff adds weight. Yet for me, the objective never changes. This speech intended to be read is my attempt to define the writer's life. You should expect such a definition to remain incomplete. In 1992, when my first novel received an award, the only thing I could remember was the judge's last sentence of praise about the fiction. And who can say that 
the anger in this novel that it is not in itself a kind of passionate expression of the quest for love. He added, there's courage here, boldness. Yes, courage goes a long way. A statement I put forward boldly and take seriously. After all, here I am. Here I stand at the John F. Kennedy Library as I talk to you, with you. I am rewriting this moment 39 times to not be overwhelmed by it. I am honored, so excited, to pay tribute to the writer who explodes the stereotype of the model minority, who deconstructs her life disastrously and bravely, whose rebellious debut as a genuine piece of literature contains the sort of substance that provides us all with great energy. These are good times, positive, not negative. If you ask me, these are the kinds of momentous literary events where the mind of the writer hypnotic, mesmerizing, happily drifts. Thoughts like the amazing encouragement one receives from the Hemingway Foundation and society send me back to childhood. I have fond memories. I'll never forget how meaningful it was to participate in the Young Authors Contest from elementary school up to 12th grade. Finally, I was able to call myself a writer, and I still say that's all that matters. I found my voice, power. Yes, you can book it, I dreamed then of saying to all the fancy publishers. However, to be totally honest, happiness for me continues to result from just being a writer, the journey there, here. I hope today's announced winners who are obviously already so talented and gifted savor this experience, relish it, and if ever facing some difficult days ahead, feel buoyed by it. Writing may very well be the trembling heart of a captive bird, but I'll tell anyone who will listen, it's far more important to understand than be understood. Kathy Acker, author of Great Expectations, called writing an emotional moving. Perry Thomas, his first book, Down These Mean Streets, focused on writing as flow. So please consider this an extended characterization. Writing is our big two-hearted river. I like how fiction helps us deal, duel with reality. Telling stories allows the crafty writer to wear the mask that grins and lies. In fact, the first time ever the world saw my face, I wanted to think the sun, I wanted it to think the sun rose in my eyes. I don't mean that as a conceit. I am referring to how optimistic, upbeat, and idealistic I've always been, knowing that writing can indeed change the world if we want it to. Writing is like rain falling from heaven that constant pelting which wakes us up, keeps us woke, baptizes us in the flood of our thoughts. Writing is water taking the shape of the thing it's in. What is not said is the title of the book I always wanted to write. The 15-page paper I wrote on Hemingway as a master's student shall be my disnarrated, that which could have been in my speech, but better off omitted, left out. It's all good, but too much to say in 10 minutes. Um, I'll confess, however, what I considered, I'll confess, however, I did focus on what I considered Hemingway's spiritual journey, specifically in The Sun Also Rises and A Farewell to Arms. I still have those inspiring pages of my life. I tried to save everything. I distinctly remember something else changing in me when I discovered The Salt Eaters, a, a novel also published in 1992. Are you sure, sweetheart, you want to be well? Author Tony K. Bambera posed to open that story, a whole new can of worms. The question got to my gut. The salt eaters compelled me to think a lot more about the urgency of healing. Writers are confluences of influences. As you can tell, I'm quite proud to suggest that. One of my favorite things comes from award-winning writer Tony Morrison. Narrative is radical creating us at the very moment it is being created. Narrative shaping us, affecting us, is the tip of the iceberg. Each of us takes resonating voices and their words to a different place. Our own writing, the art of fiction, becomes something borrowed, something new. That's the true beauty of books, too, of the spines that stand up straight and speak volumes to us. Amid all the conflict and struggle, the hustle and bustle, the content of my character continues to be about making room 
creating space for a better tomorrow. And it's clear here, I am not the only one who writes for that purpose. New day, new fate, I love to say, my mantra. The writer is a dreamer, and the dream deferred is unacceptable. We cannot afford to let life around us fester or dry up in the sun. As Hemingway pointed out, even when we appear empty, we are filling up. To all of the writers in the world, begin with a vision. Fall in love with your vision, not your words, although pictures really do tell a thousand words. And it's safe to say we are always in words, made of words, others' words. I say to you today, my friends, be the thing you want others to see. And then you can't stop, won't stop. In the words of Hemingway, nothing can hurt you, nothing can happen, nothing means anything until the next day when you do it again. Writing is call and response. And community building, something you can go to town with. And you know it's good when it's calling you. As the song goes, it's a desert road from Vegas to nowhere, but someplace better than where you've been. A good book will always provide us with a come together space. To sing the praises of chemistry in JFK Library is a real blessing, a joy. For so many of us, books are our alma mater. In the words of speculative fiction writer Samuel Delaney, books keep connecting to other books. That's what makes them live. In books I especially dig, I uncover revolution and rebirth, thing one and thing two. They wreck everything that lacks imagination and show what we can do upon crossing over into the world of make-believe. Can I tell you again how wonderful, how much of an honor it is to be in the house, so to speak? I am thrilled to be able to join in celebrating the accomplishments of a writer speeding toward a story career. I wholeheartedly congratulate Waikiki and the finalists and the honorable mentions too and thank them for their generous gift to us. Now their story is our story too in the sense that it demonstrates the powers of possibility. We love in unconventional ways and writing is one of those ways. The truth is, any success we achieve takes more heart than skill. Clearly, the reader will see craft that is impressive, yet we can easily overlook the amount of heart also put into the work to make it as outstanding as it is. Even in difficult dialogues, our discussion of a book normally leaves heart unsaid. We remove Corazon from the conversation. Nevertheless, we know. Writers obviously deserve to be recognized, appreciated, supported, and loved when we as readers, fans, still have a feeling of their heart as strongly as though they had stated it. At its best, writing is queer, defamiliarizing, its thusness deserving of our respect and awe. And it's, it's the elements of expression coming together to create a chemistry, including acknowledged thing that is always there. Fiction, we smell the truth in it, the glue holding it together. And as rapper Buster Rhymes says in the film Beyond Beats and Rhymes, word is bond. Writing is like jazz, I like to say. In the words of Louis Armstrong, the unforgettable satchmo, we all go do, re, me, but you got to find the other notes for yourself. <laughs> Understand the importance of improvising and going to where no one or nothing else has gone before. Then make writing a loop, a repetition of sound material to inspire our society. Writing is sound unbound, its most primal screams warning us of the kinks in the road. I admit if I'm guilty of anything, I try too hard to say a mouthful. Decades of black ink and I've yet to learn how to reel myself in. I punctuate too much. I'm afraid of starving the sentence, narrative, or the body of the work. On the other hand, this is my sincerest effort to write what I know. I've been able to allay my fears by hiding between the covers of a book, to borrow the language of writer E.B. White. All books are an artist's novel. They teach us the elements of style. I, too, was a journalist before becoming a novelist. 
For a daily newspaper in Decatur, Illinois, I created a column called The Fishing Condition, wrote news briefs and obituaries, took daily record of babies born in the area of hospitals, kept a chart of bowling scores to show who almost rolled a perfect game, and forced myself to write under pressure. My ultimate wish is for writers to keep trying for something that has never been done or that others have tried and failed. Impose no rules on yourself. There's still a war going on, and this spooks me. And like Hemingway, I hate it. And many of us are perhaps afraid, like me, of being a part of a lost generation. But as Hemingway said, the world is worth fighting for. And your writing helps us to overstand that. And writing can't be no part-time revolutionary, because it liberates us is the battlefield for freedom dreams. Isn't it at least pretty to think so? We must continue to restory and restore ourselves, reimagine and re-image ourselves in the world we love, live in, want to see alive and well. Make, our, make signing our signatures upon the world our raison d'etre, because in the words of writer Gwendolyn Brooks, there is always work to be done, to be done, to be done. We put our soul in the work. To everyone rewarded by pen, my advice is don't try to earn a living, but instead live a making. Because of what you are and embark on as writers, roses grow from concrete. There are many people whose lives flower rather than flounder. Whenever you step onto stage, take them with you. Even when, if, the world goes back to normal, we must let our writing be who we are. As award-winning writer, hip-hop artist, and professor of creative writing M.K. Asante urges, let the beauty of what you love be what you be, be what you do. This is probably the best craftiness I can give you as advice. After all, I always say this, this is how the story goes. In the end, what matters is not how good you are, but rather how bad you want it. Thank you. Thank you all. Good afternoon. I'm Warren Finch. I'm the sometime director of the Kennedy Library. On behalf of my colleagues at the library and at the foundation led by Executive Director Stephen Rothstein, PEN America, the Hemingway family, and all our honored guests, thank you for coming today. This concludes our program. It now gives me great pleasure to invite you down to our pavilion to celebrate this year's awards at a reception. Thank you very much.